Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, the 11th of September, 2012, and our special guest is Pat Ferenga. Pat, thanks so much for being here. My pleasure, Steve. Really delighted to have you here. Uh, his book is Teach Your Own, the John Holt Book of Homeschooling. We'll talk more about that. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for their support. The Learning 2.0 Conference is over, but the recordings are up. They're all free. Lots and lots of fun. Hopefully something you'll enjoy there. Same with Connected Educator Month. Coming up, the Future of Libraries Conference, October 3rd through 5th. The deadline for submissions for proposals is at the end of this week. Uh, we do have a hardship case dead, uh, deadline extension. If you are really at the start of the school year and need some help, but please um, try and get in this week. Uh, it just looks like it's going to be terrific. Again, that's free and online at library20.com. And then the Global Education Conference, five days, 24 hours a day. That is November 12th to 16th. Coming up uh, this week on the Future of Education, we'll talk to Shelley Blake Plock on his Digital Harbor Foundation uh, on Thursday. Uh, next week, Jamie Vollmer on Schools Cannot Do It Alone. Charles Fidel on, on what, students, what should students learn in the 21st century. And then Bob Glinner on his film, Schools That Change Communities. Lots there. New is Nikhil Goyal's One Size Does Not Fit All. Uh, the True History of the MOOC, which would be a lot of fun. And there's one more new one in here. Oh, yeah, Tony Jackson and Veronica. I don't know how to say her last name, but their book on educating for global competency. Anyway, lots of fun coming up. If after learning about John Holton homeschooling, you're even in traditional schools, then you can tune in. Uh, all of the recordings from the Future of Education are available in Blackboard Collaborate form as well as MP3. We heard from Angie McAllister, just a brilliant, interesting session on academic social networking. Uh, Ron Walk talked to us about Wasting Minds. Michael Strong talked to us about Socratic, Socratic Practice. Tony Wagner about uh, Students and Innovation. Anyway, a lot's there at futureofeducation.com and all free. So now's your chance to let us know where you're participating from. Look to the star, look to the star on the left of your screen. I have to double click it and you can click on the map. Feel free to put a shout out in the chat as well. Oh, good, Australia. Colombia, how fun. Florida. So, Pat, I'm really curious. When you speak, I'm assuming that you do speak. I do. How often? How often do you have traditional educators come to your talks? Very rarely. <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, I, I really had hoped that we would have a larger audience. I'm certainly delighted for those of you who are here. The last couple of weeks, we've been competing with the the, the Republican and Democratic conventions. But I was very curious to see how this would play with my audience, which does tend to be traditional um, schoolers. Although I think there's a fascinating kind of shift taking place. And yeah, Peggy says, what's a traditional educator? Very good question, Peggy. Hmm. I'm sure we'll get to it. I did create a Mighty Bell space for tonight's session. Mighty Bell is this new project from Gina Bianchini, who was the co-creator of Ning. Here's the link to the Mighty Bell. I put in uh, some of Pat's websites, and um, it's a chance to continue the conversation online afterwards. So hopefully uh, some of you will join that if you find value in doing so. So Pat, I, I, you know, I'm going to say kind of candidly that um, reading this book was kind of like finding uh, an old friend. Um, it was really a delightful thing for me. I'm glad to hear that. So, now my 
being in the Stanford building has had a cost. I had to open the door for somebody. I apologize. No. Uh, tell me, um, I loved the story of your growing familiarity with uh, John's work. Um, I didn't expect you to tell the whole story over again, but would you kind of give us a little bit of a recap of kind of your own progression there? Sure. Um, I had graduated uh, graduate school and expected to be a teacher. Um, school, even though I had a lot of other jobs when I was growing up, um, working in the family funeral home for one, um, I, I figured that teaching was where I wanted to be. And then in 1981, when I got to Boston, uh, they were firing teachers and not hiring them. Um, property tax rollback bills and all that stuff. So uh, I wound up working in a bookstore. And after doing retail uh, for a while, the master's degree, I felt I could do better than that. And uh, one of the cashier's husbands was volunteering at Holt Associates and recommended that I do that so I could learn this magic skill called word processing. Uh, in those days, there were independent machines. So Wang, um, John Holt's office had Olivetti's. So I went up there to learn Olivetti word processing while uh, at the same time, type, in exchange, I would type up John's correspondence um, and various orders and stuff. The company was really starting to really take off. John had started it four years earlier in 1977. And um, one day I was, one night I was working in the office and John Holt was there. And uh, he asked me who I was, where I was from. And when he heard I was from New York, you know, we shared that because he grew up in New York and shared a bunch of interest in uh, music and so on. And then he asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I said, oh, I want to be a teacher. And he said, why? And I said, because I like working with children. And John took his glasses off and stared me right in the eye and said, Pat, you got it all wrong. If you're going to be a teacher, you're not going to work with children. You're going to work on children. And that really set me back. I didn't anticipate that response. And um, I had not read anything. I didn't even know who John Holt was, to be honest. I, I mean, this is just a place to volunteer and, you know, stepping stone into some other uh, career. But um, that really took me back. And when I started to argue with John, he just put the brakes on and said, look, <laughs> I've been thinking about this and working in this field for a long time. Why don't you read one of my books and then we'll talk about it, you know. And, and I did. And the first book I tried was this book right here, Teach Your Own. It, I was unpacking the hardcover first editions as they were arriving in the office you know, that week. And I couldn't get into it. I thought that this guy was crazy and this idea was, was really ridiculous. Um, and then a friend of mine uh, working in the office suggested I start with his first book, How Children Fail. That book made sense. That just hit me between the eyes. And then I started to understand how he could wind up with homeschooling. Um, but it's quite a long journey for John, and you know, I summarize it pretty glibly there. You know, uh, uh, we've uh, often on homeschooled our children. I think we would call ourselves sort of independent schoolers when we felt like Mm -hmm. We needed to. We've been. We've made independent decisions about our kids, and I think that will come into the interview tonight. Um, but I've been fascinated at the degree to which your sort of transformation mirrored my own in terms of thinking about schooling. And part of uh, what you experienced that you were kind of in the book is sort of your watching of homeschooled children. And um, are you willing to describe that a little? Sort of what you saw in them. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, at the time, I was a single man at the time. Uh, the reason I moved to Boston to be, was to be near my girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, she's a native Bostonian. So um, one of the things that really made sense, because my wife was a feminist and, you know, she wor was working in the theater at the time, and she didn't think that, that this was something, and, you know, what, what about the, you know, how, how do the kids turn out? What, they, what sort of crazy families do this? Well, I kept meeting families as I came into the Holt office. They were always welcome. And um, indeed, John had an open house. I think it was the first Wednesday of every month. And, you know, because we really were the only game in town in those days, so to speak, people would travel from Vermont or Maine, uh, New York, just to come to the session to, to meet John or meet some other homeschoolers and talk to uh, us about, you know, the legal issues and what we're doing and so on. And I kept noticing that, the kids were, were fine. In fact, if anything, they were very comfortable around me and the other adults. And, and that is something I hear anecdotally a lot um, and, and have for the 30 years I've been involved in homeschooling is that homeschool teenagers will look adults in the eye when they talk with them. 
because they have much more experience perhaps of being around adults who aren't always just bossing them around but actually are trying to just work, work alongside or with them. So it's a, it, it really kind of, kind of hit me strong that there are other ways of raising children than what we're, we're told. So this, I'm going to use a phrase here that I'm not sure it's entirely accurate, but this is sort of a no-holds-barred look at homeschooling. I, mean, I don't think you're apologetic about um, the, the viewpoint and the like. And knowing that you know, my audience tends to be more traditional educators, um, I, I think part of what our job tonight to do is to try and bring out those pieces of the book that provide some kind of sense of um, what the implications are in terms of how you think about children, how you think about schooling, and knowing that people are going to be at different places on this journey. Um, I was really interested in John Holt's background as well, because my guess is that most people don't realize that he was a teacher and actually sort of actively worked for school reform, um, and then mm -hmm. got to a place where he made a decision that that wasn't going to work. Why was that? Mm -hmm. John realized... And as you said, I mean, John was, was so popular in the 60s um, that, you know, he was featured on the TV show uh, To Tell the Truth. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the, the movie um, Catch Me If You Can, but that movie opens with this famous TV show from the 60s where they had three people pretending to be the famous author John Holt, and the panelists had to guess who the real John Holt was, and it ended with the famous phrase, will the real John Holt please stand up? I mean, he was that well known in those days. Um, and he started to feel that he really thought that things were going to change. But by around 1969, 1970, he started to realize things weren't changing. And that, that a lot of what he was talking about, people just sort of let fall by the wayside and they moved on to the next school reform issue. And he really was try, grappling with that and trying to figure out what was going on. And um, Jonathan Kozol actually introduced him to the work of Ivan Illich. And um, Ivan Illich became a touchstone for John. Uh, in fact, so much so that John uh, flew down to Cuernavaca, Mexico, and studied with, with Ivan uh, in the early 70s. Um, in fact, I've got some slides of John Holt that he took of Ivan teaching, which are very rare because Ivan Illich hated to be photographed. Um, so uh, they're sort of like little treasures I, I have right now. But um, John, was in his discussions with um, Ivan Illich and Everett Reamer, um, all good men, people who were associated with, with the circle, he started to realize that school reform really wasn't the issue. That, if anything, sort of becomes a sideshow. The real issue is how do we treat children in society? You know, why did we separate them? Why, why did we think it was a good idea to put them in school um, in the first place? Um, as John, John wrote later in his life, um, the idea that everyone's going to learn the same thing at the same time in the same place is nutty. <laughs> why, do, why do we keep believing in this? We have so much evidence that shows that, that that's not the case and that there are other ways. And um, with that, John wound up moving towards the idea that how you treat a child is more important than what you teach them. And this marked a journey, the beginning of another journey for him, because he went from being a very traditional, and these are his own words, he was a very harsh, you know, teacher in fifth grade. He taught fifth grade from the mid-50s to the mid-60s, and then he wound up teaching at Harvard as a guest lecturer and some other places. Um, but, you know, he, he just kept realizing that he was teaching, but the kids weren't learning. And... He wrote, we could talk about, about the reasons for that, but uh, to, to stay with the, the story of his, his progression, he, he then went from becoming this super tough teacher to a rather progressive you know, teacher, uh, trying to bring the real world in the classroom. And uh, other educators like George Dennison and um, Jim Herndon were really you know, on board with these ideas of John's, and, and he got a lot of support from them. But uh, when he saw that this wasn't going this way, he, you know, in the sense of getting a critical mass behind him, started to think maybe Illich was right, and maybe, maybe it's a social issue. So the next book that John worked on after he did four books about education reform, it's a book called Escape from Childhood, uh, The Rights and Needs of Children, 
as John was really advocating, and there actually was a, a little blip of positive movement towards children's rights. Uh, I actually have a book by B. and Ron Gross called The Children's Rights Movement. Um, it, they were actually able to create an anthology. There was that much writing in the early 70s about this. But that didn't go very far. Um, liberals hated the idea that um, children should be able, to, for instance, to choose their own guardian. And conservatives hated the idea that children should be able to choose what and when to learn things. Um, and so I, one of the things I, just as an aside, one of the things I'm working on right now is to bring an ebook version of, of Escape from Childhood out because the book's been out of print for 25 years. But it, it, as I reread it, I'm just amazed at how prescient it is and, and how applicable to today's society it is. So, but then one, once John saw that idea wasn't going to fly, try to figure out some other ways. And he, he wrote um, several books about, you know, why do I do Monday, how to implement his ideas in the classroom. Um, and then finally, uh, he wrote a book called Instead of Education. And at the end of that book, he calls for an underground railroad to get children away from the destructive effects of compulsory schools. In the book, he's very careful to explain that schools have a, a place, and he describes what, you know, very positive places like bullet schools, karate schools, cooking schools, land, you know, all sorts of places that people voluntarily choose to go to. But the, the idea of just being forced to attend all the time and be forced to go through the, the motions um, of what you know, Ivan Illich termed the secular liturgy of education, um, you know, and what Yvonne and John felt was an empty ritual, <laughs> an empty, you know, it, it was really uh, uh, a waste of time in a, uh, uh, for the teacher and for the students. The sh a charade of learning, John Holt called it in his first book, uh, How Children Fail. Um, and he didn't want to do that. He wanted genuine learning. Let's have some real encounter. What do I, or, uh, George Dennison uh, calls, um, oh gosh, it's right, right on my, my mind, uh, re the reality of encounter, I think. Anyway. Um, after that, he wrote this call for an underground railroad, people wrote to John saying, you don't need an underground railroad, you can teach your children yourself. And he wanted to learn more about this, so he started to find out that as he corresponded with these people, uh, that book came out in 1976, that these people didn't know that there are other people homeschooling. So he immediately saw a need to put them together, and uh, he founded Growing Without Schooling magazine a year later. It was the summer of 1977. And uh, the, the, it stayed in print until uh, 2001. And so he, he really changed from becoming a, a harsh teacher to becoming a progressive educator, becoming a social critic and social reformer. And then finally, at the end of his life, an unschooler, which is a phrase, that, a word that John coined. <laughs> I think it is fascinating to hear that history, in large part for educators who uh, might not have realized that there was sort of this depth of thinking and traditional schooling um, behind John and that movement. I also think there are a lot in our community who would actually really agree with a lot of the principles, but would have a hard time going to the same sort of place of conclusion. Um, one of the sort of easy criticisms of John, and this is what I struggled with, is that he did not have his own children and he hadn't studied education. And my guess is that that comes up a lot. My answer to that, and I'm curious as to your response, was I actually wondered if that gave him uh, uh, some needed distance that, that sort of fatigue, fatigued parents and teachers don't normally have, sort of a grandparent effect, sort of the ability to look a little bit more objectively. As the parent of four children, I know that fatigued moment and how hard it is to get to the grandparent moment. Is that a fair way of thinking about the fact that he that he didn't have his own children? I think that's fair. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, a book that I'm currently working on um, is uh, the working title is John Holt, The Celebration of His Life. And I've, we're doing this with uh, Carlo Ricci up at the University of Nipissing in uh, Ottawa, Canada. And um, we've contacted uh, people who knew John um, before he became a teacher, former students of John's, and then homeschoolers who are now growing up who knew John when they were kids and their parents. And we're getting, we're trying to get a nice round portrayal of, of, of John um, to, to, to sort of 
put flesh to the bones, uh, so to speak. And one of, one of the things that, that comes up, you know, certainly something that I, I saw firsthand, was John was unlucky in love. I mean, you know, reporters did ask him why he didn't have children. As he said, it wasn't because he didn't try. <laughs> you know, he was sort of an eccentric character and completely devoted to his work. So I could see how that, that could create some difficulties there. But he always enjoyed being in the company of children and families. And so when you say grandfather, Steve, I, I think that's accurate because when I had to book his uh, speaking engagements, he asked me to always try and get him to stay with a family if possible instead of in a hotel. Um, that, that was his preference. And in fact, one of the ways he grew the homeschooling movement was that whenever he got a speaking engagement, and they typically were at universities or think tanks, um, we would immediately, well, I would, <laughs> start to send out feelers to the homeschoolers that we had in, in the state and see if they would want to host the talk by John and stuff. So basically the, uh, the plane fare and the accommodations uh, to get John started were paid for by, by his uh, speaking gig. But then he would spend another week or so just talking a small group, sometimes in living rooms and libraries. Um, I have a, a photo of John when he had a, a huge melanoma on his leg and he was sitting on, um, this is maybe eight, eight or ten months before he passed away. And he was sitting in a beach chair in a park with about 100 people around him, talking to them about homeschooling then. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's not the movement that we think of. And this is one of the things that I think educators have a hard time understanding is, is that, you know, this too is, is how a movement can get started. And this too is what teaching is. It, it doesn't have to be stand and deliver before a classroom. It, it, it has discourse, social discourse. As sort of like what we're doing here, although it is kind of more talking at people than with people. But John, John did that a lot. And um, so I, I, I do feel that uh, he had an insight. And then your, your point about him not being trained as an educator, well, I'm pretty sure it, he's written this in several places, that he felt that that was one of the great strengths that he brought to the whole uh, issue of school, is that he didn't have his head full of all these theories about what was possible for a kid. And I was so relieved and, and pleased when I, I listened to a lecture on uh, last Friday that Sugata Mitra did. Uh, he's visiting MIT, and he did one of these webinars. And turns out he's a physicist. He never studied education either. But because he didn't come with all these assumptions about what kids can and can't do, he just created an empirical experiment to see. He was very pleased to watch how these inner, uh, these rural poverty-stricken children in India are able to teach themselves how to use a computer. So um, I, I think that one of the problems with education is that it's become a closed, like, a echo chamber, and that voices outside of it are not allowed to be heard or are just not given consideration. I can't tell you uh, since 1981 how many times people in the schools even if they, they come around or, or, or do agree with me to begin with, say, yeah, but it's impractical for most people. This isn't going to go anywhere. Well, there are now more children being taught at home than there are in Montessori schools and Waldorf schools and independent schools and democratic schools combined in America. So over 2 million kids being taught at home. And worldwide, I, I, I wouldn't even venture to guess what the number is, but it, it's considerable. So, yeah, it's growing slowly. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education says it's about 2% of the school population. But that's far more than John Holt ever thought. He thought no more than 1% of the population would ever homeschool. And that's one of the things that I think that traditional educators need to, to understand and stop worrying about, <laughs> about homeschoolers like uh, everyone's going to leave schools. No, it's, it's a difference. In fact, in my own, my own case with my three daughters, they've been, they were in and out of school a couple of times. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about how homeschooling takes place, and educators just assume it's all done by themselves and you know, at home, and they're just setting up miniature schools at home. And that was the last idea that John Holt ever, ever wanted to see in school and in, in, in someone's home, and that he wrote a lot about and that I continue to talk about and encourage. So I want to use your comment on Sugata Mitra to sort of springboard to have you give us a sense of some of the core principles that lie behind uh, John's and your philosophies of learning. Um, 
part of what I really love about the Suganamitra stories is the degree to which they show learning as social. And that's certainly not a new concept, but it's one that uh, often gets sort of ignored or forgotten um, under other things. Um, and, and I think I'm right in, in remembering from the book that, that John talked about children do want to fit in, they want to take part, they want to do what's right, and that they have this sort of natural inclination toward learning together. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, it absolutely is. And, and, and thank you, Steve, for, for, for noting that because one of the misunderstandings about John Holt's ideas about education is that, you know, he feels like, the, like the, some people, and I don't think that they read John or if they do that, I read him closely, they think he's a Rousseauian, you know, wants to separate children from the adults and just put them in with special teachers until, you know, so the world doesn't corrupt them. John said children are social, learn through, so, are social beings and learn by being social. And they learn by being around people. <laughs> now, some, certainly some people are quiet and others more outgoing and we know about multiple intelligences and learning styles and all that jazz. And that, that's great, you know, and if in school you need that to maybe break all this down. But in reality, in, in, well, not reality, but in the world outside of school, let's say, that just happens. I mean, you know, you, 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 know, you have to, to give and take. And um, one of the, the more exciting things for me recently um, has been working with uh, Dr. Peter Gray um, and several friends of ours uh, uh, as we, we're trying to figure out, like, what is going on with uh, children's um, large, I mean, the large increase in psychopathology and uh, problems with school and, and all sorts of other issues. And Peter's research and a lot of what we're, we're so showing is that um, it's related to a lack of play, that kids learn to negotiate and develop emotional intelligence and develop social skills by playing, by creating the rules of the game and arguing about them and then settling them. We're way too quick to jump in as adults. We don't give the kids enough space to work these things out. And it's kind of scary for me, um, you know, because, you know, I'm not, I mean, Peter's a, a, a older than me, but I'm not that much younger than him. And I'll never forget, there was a movie that my girls were watching about when they were younger. They're all now grown up, they're a young woman. But um, when they were, they were young girls, they loved this movie um, and called Now and Then. And it's a, a chick flick. But in it, uh, there's a scene where all the kids, as they're rem reminiscing about their childhood, are back in their, their 1970s development, riding bikes and playing bicycle tag, and other kids are on the sidewalk, you know, talking, and other kids are, like, you know, drawing with chalk on the sidewalk. All sorts of activity going on. And my kids stopped the video and just looked at my wife and I said, why can't we have this? And that was, like, in the late 80s. And that was so sad to me, because even by then, Children's free play out in the street. And, and literally, I grew up in the Bronx. Yeah, you can say you play in the street, you know, and no one got hurt. We saw cars coming, we got out of the way. And here we have a backyard with a, a jungle gym and stuff that we encourage kids from the neighborhood to come in and use. And, you know, it's this whole social nature of learning. And John saw that so clearly, and he saw that how school interfered with that. And that, that is one of the sad things that, you know, we think that, oh, just by putting kids in a group, it's going to be a social, a social experience that's positive. And then when we cut recess and phys ed and art and everything, you know, to make time for more learning time, um, it, it, it's a shame. And so, you know, Peter comes at it from a democratic school, Sudbury Valley point of view. I'm here with the John Holt on schooling point of view. Friends of ours, I run Open Connections, Peter Bergson down in Philadelphia, work at Kevin Soling, a filmmaker. Kirsten Olson, who you're going to be interviewing, uh, was part of our group for a long time. And we were, you know, all trying to figure out, like, how, what's the one issue we can all agree on? And it was that, play. The whole social nature of a child's life has been ruined by this mad religion of education where everybody has to learn the same thing at the same time perfectly. So you've identified play as a core issue. I, I really appreciate that, and I'm going to think a lot about that tonight, I'm sure. I've been kind of using the word agency to describe my core issue. 
which is the inability that we seem to have to be planning for students to be self-directed. And uh, that has always been kind of a part of my experience with my own kids, is trying to figure out how do I help them become self-directed in their lives. How does that match up with your beliefs? Match, matches up pretty well. I think that that one of the things that we, we forget and again, this is a, a very simple idea, and I heard John say it many times. Um, but like most simple ideas, like you know, they're very hard to implement. And 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 that is that children and um, how can I put this? <laughs> um, Steve, ask me the question again. I, I think I'm, I'm going to get. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, <laughs> when you used the words that the, the core issue for you was play, I realized that for me the core issue has been agency. So I didn't want to presume agency. that that was a big part of your thing. I actually got that from yes. uh, William Glasser, uh, who also gave me the grandparent piece, the sort of this ability that mm -hmm. grandparents have to have perspective on growth and development that the struggling battle line parent has a hard time with. But but I, I guess I was just curious as to your take on self-directed right. learning right. agency. Right. And, and so what I remember John saying, I, I, I started to lose my train of thought there, is that the way you get good at making choices, the way you develop agency and figure out, like, what, what is good for me and what's bad for me is by having a lot of choices to make. And we got in a lot of arguments with my, my mom and dad, for instance, and, and even my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law. <laughs> our, our kids were very young, like two, three to five, because we would talk with them. We would, we would ask them, what do you want to do? And we would actually sit there, and they would get so upset with us. It's, just tell them we're going, and let's get going. Or just tell them to do this. And it's like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, we're saying, look, we're going to, you know, Certainly, there are some times where they don't have a choice because we all have to do things together as a family. But this idea of allowing children choice and, and having agency in family decisions, um, John was, was very strong about this. And many homeschooling families have picked up on this advice and find it, it works very well. Involve your children as soon as they, they express the, an interest in, like, understanding the family finances. Explain how that works. Explain how a checkbook works. Get them, you know, get them involved in, the, in home economics, so to speak. Uh, you know, it's it's a step above a lemonade stand in a way. Although lemonade stands are great, so by giving children more and more choices, they will eventually get better at making them. Sure, they're going to make a lot of bad choices, but that's the point. If you just say you can't make a choice, you can't make a choice, so you're fully educated, and then at the age of I don't know, 15 or 12 or now I guess we'd say 22 when you're 21 or 22 when you graduate college. Then you can go into the world and start making your choices. Um, you know, it, it, I think that, that you've been sold the bill of goods. Um, and, and I've certainly seen the results in my own life of my own girls and in my friends' life and, and people that I've met who, whose children have had the choice of, of for instance, and we're talking you know, intellectual choices here, such as do I want to study? Uh, math right now. Do I even want to learn math? Um, I've had many kids, you know, who say, no, I'd rather learn magic tricks or I'd rather play the piano or whatever. And they they do that. And then if they do need to learn math, uh, I'm thinking of my oldest daughter, uh, she didn't, you know, she struggled with math as I did in school, but I was a perfect charade of learning kid. I passed all my tests in Spanish and in math. I can't do math very well, and I certainly can't speak Spanish. <laughs> but uh, my daughter, Lauren, uh, when she decided that she wanted to become a psychology major, she was told she had to take statistics, and since she couldn't do statistics, she took a Fundamentals of Math course at our local community college, and in six months learned all the math she needed to then move into the psychology class, which then became her major, and she got a scholarship to go to a four-year college and become a, psych a psychology major. So this idea that, that we have to force kids constantly because we know they're going to make bad choices, that they're always going to choose to eat candy, for instance, is, is wrong. Uh, you know, it's more of a, of a fear and a prejudice that's unfounded than, than a reality. And I've been very lucky to see that in my own life, and I hope that other parents will try it too. I mean, 
you don't have to go whole hog. I mean, some parents, radical unschoolers, yeah, you know, they, they let their kids stay up all night. You could start small. <laughs> you could start with, like, what book do you want to read? <laughs> Eventually work up to, you know, so you don't, really don't want to go to school today <laughs> and figure that one out. But um, there, there's many, many steps along the way that everyone can take. It, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. But the more choices you can provide your children at every step of that way, and the more you involve them in the decision-making that, that you're involved in, the, the more agency you help them develop. We have a good friend who has a 14-year-old son, and um, sort of talking through us some of the things that uh, she was trying to figure out with her son, and, and we had said, well, have you asked him you know, what he likes to do and uh, what classes he would like to take? And so, so she went and did this, and she said she had never actually asked him what he wanted to do. And she said, you know, he, uh, he has a great conversation, and she felt like her brain began to kind of explode in a positive way, that all of a sudden she realized that, th that this was some, a question that she might have asked. So if we, I, I want to I use another piece here for, for springboarding. Uh, you described the situation with your in-laws. Tony Wagner, who was on the show a week or two ago, talked about um, people feeling like they were outliers when they were making independent decisions about their children and education or students. And I certainly, my wife and I certainly experienced almost identical responses, both from our friends and our family. Is there something we could learn about kind of our cognitive social situation by that kind of response that you get to doing something different. Is is that part of the hold that schooling has on us, is just that there is a sort of conformance fear factor associated with it? Does that occur to you? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, one, you know, it, it works in two ways, I feel, too. I mean, first there's the peer group and the fear of just being different, you know, um, and we've certainly seen this um, with girls and, and in the um, late 90s, um, reviving Ophelia and um, works like that where they're talking about how girls deliberately dumb themselves down in school to fit in so that they don't stand out. Um, and my colleague, Susanna Shepherd wrote a book called The Sense of Self where she wanted to see if this was true of homeschooled girls, who, you know, high school age girls. And she found it wasn't, that even though they had um, difficult relationships sometimes with their parents, their mother in particular, they didn't want to, them to go away and they didn't want to push them away permanently. Um, and, you know, and, and so th there is a, a lot of, um, you know, this issue of trying to fit in in school. And that's for the kids. But then there's, there's yet another element that I learned when my middle daughter, uh, who stopped homeschooling in seventh grade and decided that she wanted to go to school, um, when she got to high school, one of the most common things that I heard, and I've heard this from a lot of her friends, so maybe some listeners have heard this too, <laughs> she would say, that teacher doesn't like me. And, and, and you know, te and, and the, it, she couldn't change a class, and there was just this attitude that, she, she had to behave a certain way or put up with certain things because the teacher didn't like her. And half the time I'm not even sure that was true because I had some of these teachers I knew, but there's a relationship that happens in school, and we've seen this as it gets more professional. You know, um, don't touch, don't, you know, don't get too familiar with your students and so on. And I understand why that's there. But I think we've taken it a little too far in, the, in, in that professional direction, and the kids are feeling that. And so it's hard for them to stand out from their peer group if they feel they're not going to get the support from the adults for doing that. And, um, and, and many of them don't feel comfortable with the, the teachers there. And it would be great if they had the ability to have other adults to talk to or, or to, uh, you know, to, to shepherd them into other social situations. But pretty much we kick them in the deep end of the pool and it's sink or swim when it comes to this stuff. And most of the kids all just huddle together <laughs> and just like band together, you know, and just say, okay, let's all stick together and no one wants to stand out. So um, um, there was some, <laughs> there was an emergency alarm here. I apologize. I, I got sidetracked. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Okay, so it, it also feels as though there's a little bit of a um, 
kind of a um, an exposing of a view of human nature and life that comes out in some of these reactions to homeschooling, right? If it, you you talk about it in the book, and I certainly think this the, my experience would um, would correlate to that, which is uh, you just have to do things you don't like to do. I don't like the job I'm in. Part of schooling is just learning to do what you don't like to do. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm well, in John's very first book, he he wrote about that, and that was one of those phrases that really made me think this man is onto something. And that phrase was, "I wouldn't do it unless I was made to do it." Is the creed of a slave. I was later informed um, by Ivan Illich that um, school, as we know it, has, to use Ivan's phrase, the stain of slavery, the stain of slavery attached to it, because the original school, the scholae of the Greeks, was not like today where anyone can go to public school. It was just for the elite, and its primary purpose, particularly if you read Plato, is to rule other people and how to use those people for the state's you know, benefit. Um, foreigners, women, uh, freemen, uh, freed slaves, they were not allowed to, to participate in, in, in these schools. And so that's, you know, when people talk about, you know, Socrates and Aristotle and so on, and let's not forget, Socrates was killed because he was asking the kids to question him, <laughs> among other things. You know, that, that was one of the, uh, the problems about, you know, encouraging questioning and encouraging agency among children is they'll challenge you. And some people don't, you know, uh, a lot of people don't don't like this like that. Um, you know, it's more sit down, shut up, and do as I say. And this sort of, you know, I mean, it's not just homeschooling. We're I'm, we're well aware that there are there are schools that 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 try to encourage this, but there are less and less. And I think that's one of the reasons why homeschooling is growing is because there, there's always a need for 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 places like this and teachers like this. But um, they're harder and harder to find as we standardize school. As, and I mean, another thing Yvonne pointed out is, and John echoes this, school is the same wherever you go in the world. <laughs> you know, the, the curriculum changes, but the structure, what Jacques Lul terms the technology of school, is the same. The bell rings or, you know, you get a little, you know, my wife works in a charter school, so they don't have bells. They have little alarms on their laptops that tell them when the schools have to change. But, you know, it's not an organic moment, you know, where like, okay, we're done with this. It's like, oh, okay, the bell's wrong. The factory, the factory line is stopped. You know, take your break and move to the next station. So, John, again, I'm kind of a er, – John, Pat. <laughs> I bet that happens a lot. Um, I'm trying to make a, you know, sort of some connections here with, but with why a lot of people in our audience would agree with your – feelings, but would be struggling to try and understand why sort of schooling perpetuates. Um, one of the ideas I wrote down was a control. And as a parent, I'm, I'm well familiar with the, the, the degree to which control is an easy shortcut. Um, and so it feels like there's sort of benign control issues. And then there maybe are some sort of stronger control issues like political power or institutional advantage. From your perspective, how do you describe this? I mean, is part of the reason schools perpetuate and exist the way they are because people benefit from it? Well, certainly people benefit from it in the sense that, you know, those who have a vested interest, you know, in, in keeping, you know, uh, schools alive, um, as we know them. I mean, this is the irony is like if John point, and, and Illich point out that there are other places besides school where we can learn, or schools that, that are more humane um, and that are, are more in tune with the rhythms of, of, of how a person would learn in, without being forced through a factory process. Um, but I, I, I feel that, first of all, school supports a consumer society in a, in, in a very important way. It, it teaches you from the earliest stage, from the minute you get in there, to consume these little bits of knowledge, these abstractions, and, and feel that they're very valuable. And we get a diet of these things, and, you know, and we know that you know, for, mo for most of us, certainly for me, 
a lot, particularly in math, a lot of that just washed over me. I I didn't get it. Truly stayed abstract. Um, and you know, we just get kind of get used to this this like blah blah blah, like Charlie Brown. I, I always thought that was brilliant. Whenever they used to have a teacher talk in Charlie Brown, it's never words. It's always a I think a trombone going wah wah wah. <laughs> And that's it. We start to think that the words are just nonsense. And we have to, to trust the figures in front of us, and their authority figures. And um, John was, uh, we sold the book, Obedience to Authority. He was a, a very uh, strong believer in the Milgram experiment and, and its lessons and, and, and that we need to, to take them to heart. But, you know, combine like these authority figures who say things that are eventually become meaningless to you over and over. And it sort of deadens you and makes, you know, it, it certainly turns some kids off to school, if not a lot. And I think it ultimately turns us off to a lot of authority figures in our lives. Um, politicians now, I mean, we're so used to them saying one thing and almost immediately knowing that they mean something else. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of hard for words and actions to match up, um, you know. And I think that a lot of this confusion starts in school. Um, so, and, and there, there's, there's a lot. I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't done deliberately. I'm, I'm not, a, a John Gatto is a dear friend of mine, but I don't share the conspiracy theories of why school is the way it is that he does. It's just morphed into this way where now, you know, we, Eisenhower talked about the military industrial complex. Now we have an education industrial complex. I mean, we have places, you know, that are manufacturing education. Uh, we don't call them diploma mills, but, you know, when, when we keep hearing these calls that we need to have more diplomas than other countries, and why? I would, when when uh, our President Obama said that uh, that was one of our national goals, I, and I support Obama, but I was really disappointed to hear that because, you know, why? Canada is a country that has the most college degrees, then comes, I think, uh, Israel and um, Japan, we're, we're fourth. Um, we're, we have 41%, there are 50. What's the big push? <laughs> Why is it 9% so vital for the national interest? It's just a counting game. It's more wah, wah, wah. It's like we're number one, but, but why? How does that help? How's number one with college degrees helped Canada? You know, I mean, it's, I'd like to know. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm just trying to, to really understand why it's so important that we have more degrees in other countries. So I've made this argument now twice before. This will be the third time. In full disclosure, the first two times I've made it, I have been disagreed with. Both Tony Wagner and Michael Strong disagreed with me. But I'm, I'm interested in the connection between um, the value politically of a populace that is not independent thinking and is conformance oriented. Um, and the ways in which, um, maybe not in Machiavellian contexts or conspiracy theory, but those who have lobbying dollars are not going to use that money to lobby for the kinds of policies that would create independent thinking. Um, it does feel to me like there is a political benefit to having a populace that is uncomfortable with thinking independently. If you tell me I'm way off base here, that'll be the third time and I'll give it up. <laughs> well, I don't think you're off base. It's just a matter of degree. Um, you know, John Gatto write, writes at length about that. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know a lot of the sources that he cites, but I'm thinking of a book that I read years ago, but, you know, The Irony of Early School Reform by uh, Joel Spring. And, you know, he makes a similar point in point there that, you know, um, no, it, well, I, I, I haven't read the book in a while, so I shouldn't go, go, go to it. But, but, you know, the point being that there is perhaps, a, and again, in a consumer society, you don't want people to question things too deeply because um, if people can figure out they can make their own food, grow their own food, um, you know, learn stuff. I mean, I was, I was so pleased to hear Sugata Mitra say in his lecture that uh, he felt that if you gave a group of children access to the internet and a search engine, they could teach themselves anything up until the postgraduate level. You know, I mean, we, we have the, you know, we can have so many 
I mean, there's no bold ideas. I mean, I, that, that's what attracts me to the John Holt's work and, and people like him who are, who are trying to think broadly and, and widely and deeply about what it is to, to create a learning society um, instead of this mandatory continuing education society that, that, that we are clearly on a path toward. Um, so I, I would really um, not disagree with you, <laughs> Steve. Uh, again, I, 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 I don't go as far as I say it was deli a deliberate path chosen. Um, I mean, he cites you know, Rockefeller and the Trilateral Commission and so on. <laughs> but I, I, I do feel that, you know, right now one of the problems with school reform, a lot of people point to, to teachers' unions, but, hey, look at the Common Core. Who's cheering the Common Core on the most, as far as I can see? That's big business. They love the idea of, having, of finally being able to sell 65 million textbooks without having to make each one different for each state. And that's why they're behind it. And to say that they're there for the kids, well, that, by the way, is another issue that why it's so hard to change schools is they have this mission of caring for kids. How do you argue with that? Right from the, right from the get-go, you're, you're, you're a bad guy if you question, question that. Um, uh, what the social critic John McKnight called the mask of caring. Uh, they put this mask on and you can't attack them anymore. It becomes very hard because what else is going to happen to these kids? And that's what I want to talk about. What, what else can? I, I don't want to throw them out and defund schools and defund society and everyone for themselves. I believe in the Commonwealth. But what else can we do? I mean, we can re rethink this in so many ways. And I'm so fortunate that I've found and, and have been embraced uh, by so many people who come to this conclusion um, around the world. I mean, I've, I, you know, and are creating these little pockets of learning centers or just community and they, they grow and expand. Some stick around for a longer time uh, after the founders of the children have grown. Others, they just disappear because now they're not needed anymore. Just like schools in the neighborhood now become office buildings when uh, the families move out of the neighborhood. Um, you know, and and this, this is different than the idea that we're going to create a magnet school. It's going to be here forever, and this is the way that kids have always learned. It's really sad to me that um, we keep pouring money into these big, big magnet type schools instead of really trying to think of how to create, like maybe with that money, a hundred little schools that each one is focused on a different thing, an academy for basketball. I mean, kids can learn reading, writing, and arithmetic by playing basketball. If they, you know, we can be so much bigger and creative with our ideas here. But instead, it's we're just locked in, and I think that that you know, you're right that there's a lot of vested interest in keeping that lock and that, you know, we, we like to point, again, you know, to teachers' unions, but very small piece of the puzzle. It's a, it's a, lot, a, a lot bigger forces are at play here. Okay, so maybe I'm one for three. I'll give myself a soft count there. Um, I'm interested in uh, something I seem think I'm noticing, which is it feels to me like mobile technology and social media have given kids a sense of independence. Uh, there's a difference between our oldest child and our youngest um, in terms of her ability to connect with other people and to be sort of proactive in the world. And I've wondered if that uh, we will ultimately look back on that and see this as an empowering moment for youth. Do you think that's possible? I hope it's possible, Steve. <laughs> was, uh, if anything, you know, I mean, look, look at the facts. Um, we've infantilized children. Um, you know, they're having, they're, they're, they're leaving the home much later. They're graduating college and not having children, not getting married, not getting full-time jobs. And I know we're blaming the economy, but this was happening before 2008. Wonderful book called Huck's Raps by Stephen Mintz, a, a History of American Childhood. And he talks about this, and, and part of the reason is, well, we created adolescence. It didn't exist until G. Stanley Hall came up with the, the, the concept. And then, you know, we, we've expanded the years of schooling, and now we're talking about ex extending it to preschool and extending high school. Um, you know, the, the institution has gotten so big and, um, that it, it long ago crossed the, the level that Illich called the paradoxical counterproductivity. Namely, an institution 
gets so big that then it, be, it, it actually causes the problems. Hospitals suddenly become distribution centers for illness, iatrogenic illnesses and the super, uh, the MRSAs and super viruses and so on. Uh, departments of transportation are now create monumental traffic jams. The big, big in Boston is a great example. Uh, you know, we have so many of these, and, and, but we just keep thinking bigger, 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 instead of small is beautiful. How can we cut this down? And actually, to me, this creates more jobs for teachers. It creates more jobs for everybody and more involvement. But it, it requires an openness towards, you know, not, not having everyone be a certified teacher, for instance. Not have everybody be the same age in a classroom. Not have everybody learn the same thing at the same time. Um, and then, therefore, that's going to you know, mess up things like the PISA standardized tests and all this other stuff. But I, I'm more concerned about individual children and how they learn and how they can find work worth doing and a life worth living than I am concerned about creating a better education or whatever that may be. Pat, when you go around and give talks about sort of helping parents gain perspective on education. How do you introduce parents to these concepts? Uh, Alfie Cohn said he asks a question, you know, what, what, um, uh, what, were, what were your best learning experiences and what do you want for your children? Do you have kind of an opener that you use to get people uh, willing to, to rethink their perspective? Um, I don't have a pat question like that. I, I tend to change depending on the audience. Um, but I, I, the, the general tack I take with that is to reflect on your own school experiences. Because I know that nine out of the ten people that are there are there to hear me talk are there because things aren't going so well with their kids or things didn't go well in school for them and they don't want their kids to relive that. I mean, th that was the situation for my wife and I. We were both good students. We were exactly the sorts of students John describes in How Children Fail, you know, prep schools and all that stuff. But when we graduated, we were like, is that all there is? Is this it? You know, is this all school is? Read a book and take a test? You know, and we wanted more for our kids. And I'm so glad that, that we had homeschooling to, to offer them. So we've probably got time for one or two short questions. I apologize. I care enough about this topic that I monopolize the time. But if you have a question for <laughs> Pat, please feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, the, uh, I made note of the book. Was it Huck's Raft? Was that the book you mentioned? Yes, Huck's Raft by Stephen Mintz. Aside from your own work here uh, in John's books, are there places that you point people to who are struggling um, who work in the education system and want to make a difference, um, really like these ideas but aren't quite sure what to do next? Yes. Um, I, I like, well, first of all, there's a lot of alternative schools and educators who, you know, they fit in, in with this, although they may, they may object to being affiliated with homeschooling. But, you know, I, I, I cite, uh, like, the Reggio Emilia schools, um, I try to, to introduce people to um, the Albany Free School. Uh, Chris Macaliano's uh, got a, a wonderful a couple of wonderful books about the school, as well as how to start your own school. Um, and I often find, like you know, especially with educators, it, you know, talking about a school or a situation that exists, like learning centers or something like that, that have always interested me, um, and finding that there's more and more coming around that are that are more like what I what I would like to see and you know in the sense of being places where kids can drop in and hang out and be safe and have access to people and things to do and so very often um, you know for instance I, I wrote about uh, a blog for um, oh it's called educational IT um, and it, it, it was just this week, I was writing about the fab labs, uh, which were created at MIT, and then um, another uh, organization called Sprout and & Company in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, and, and both of them are learning centers, but they're, they're, they have completely different approaches to how they engage the community. Um, and then there's North Star out in uh, South Hadley, Massachusetts. I recommend a lot of, um, a lot of teachers who want to find places uh, to, to do things with kids, but they don't want it to be like school, but they know that they can't do it at home. 
North Star is a great place. Uh, the Purple Thistle Learning Center, run by Matt Hearn out in Vancouver, British Columbia, is another one. Um, they're, they're out there. These places exist. Um, and, and then there are, there are learning centers just for homeschoolers, um, like Voyagers here in Massachusetts. Um, so there, there's a lot of, of, of entree points if an educator wants to, to, to come from the classroom. Because this is how I get started with, with, with parents, particularly if they've been homeschooling, meaning they've been doing school at home and they, they now want to loosen up. You got to start where you're comfortable because we all tend to teach the way we were taught. So, you know, if, if the math curriculum isn't working, drop that. Keep everything else if that's working for you, but drop that and just start to take note of all the math that they do in their lives. And, you know, and, and you keep that to yourself and keep, you know, keep that journal, maybe share it with your spouse. And, and then eventually, you know, I guarantee the kids will ask questions that involve math and you then provide those answers. Um, so I, I really do find that, that uh, particularly with, with educators, it's, it's best to talk, and, and for parents who are not familiar with, with these ideas at all, that you've got to start where you're comfortable and work your way into them. Because just like me and just like you, see, books, John's words were one thing, but it wasn't until I met the kids. It wasn't until I met the families. It wasn't until I had my own kids. And I, and I saw that everything that John was saying about how children learn, without, you know, because that book is written about five kids five years old and younger. And it, 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 it's so, it, the, the truth in that book rings so loudly. And, you know, when you realize how much a child learns independently in those years and how now uh, we feel that they can't. I remember speaking in London back in 1999, and I asked, I mean, I, 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 I used to have this phrase. I said, I mean, how many of you taught your children to walk and talk? And that's almost always a laugh line. But in London, two people raised their hands, and I was kind of shocked, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and I think more and more there's this attitude that we need to teach our children to walk and talk, which is something that we know from millennia children have been doing successfully on their own. Pat, as a courtesy to our guests, we always give the option of finishing on time. There are four questions that came in. I'm, I'm glad to keep going if you'd like, or I would also be glad to just send you those by email and give you a chance to respond offline later, and I can post them on the blog post. Uh, would you prefer uh, to go? I'll be happy to stick around for another few minutes and answer the question. Okay, well, well you tell us when you're done. Uh, Peggy wanted to know, uh, when you talk to parents, do you give them ways to continue to learn about and connect with others who share the same beliefs? Absolutely. Create, you know, um, I do a workshop uh, called Teach Your Own, a seminar about homeschooling and unschooling. And one of the, the topics is how to create your support base. And um, one of the uh, important things to remember is um, your child's support base and your support base are not necessarily homeschoolers with the same beliefs and the same age children. It's lovely and fantastic when that happens, but it doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> You know, or it doesn't happen forever. It may happen in a year of personality differences, or people move, situations change, the kids go back to school. So, you know, what you need to do is find, you know, who are your child's peers? Well, they're the kids that are interested in the same thing your kids are in. Or, you know, if it's karate, if it's math, if it's computers, singing, uh, playing Legos. You know, that's their peers. You know, it doesn't always have to be other homeschoolers. And, um, and then, you know, for you, you know, you should have an active life, too, as, a, as, as an adult. And, you're in, and your support base, I mean, it can, I mean, I, I know that in some situations it, it is just your husband, your spouse, or if you're a single parent, you know, your, your relatives or some close friend. But if you can be involved in other activities and, you know, that, that are yours, you know, um, that you're not doing, in other words, you're not doing them so your kids will learn something. You're doing them because you like to sew or you like to, to uh, sing in a choir and stuff. And, and that becomes your, you know, you find your friends and support there. Um, you know, again, it's very hard for us to imagine what that would be like because um, in school it's like, you know, you have, you know, everything is set up in clubs. But, or you have counselors and, and so on. You know, it's, it's all provided for you. 
but um, a lot, not everyone benefits from it or takes advantage of it. And uh, a lot of uh, parents and homeschooling often find that, um, you know, their support group is really important to them. Uh, and, you know, and, and they're lucky when, when they can find that. But more often than not, I mean, you know, we started homeschooling in 1981. Well, not really. I sort of worked in 19. We didn't start homeschooling until uh, 1986 when we had our first child. But um, you know, back then there was no internet. <laughs> you know, I mean, people say, "How did you homeschool without the internet?" You know, I think in some ways it may have been easier because it wasn't all these constant ads coming into my mailbox about teach your child how to learn math while they're sleeping and stuff like that. Okay, ready for another, or are you done? Sure, let's do it. Okay, on. so uh, Melanie wants to know, how do you think that the lessons we are learning from homeschool will affect public schooling, especially in terms of use of technology? Wow. Well, I think that one of the, you know, if you have a child that's interested in technology, but they're not like, you know, a, a, a catching the eye of some chief technology teacher in, in, in the school, homeschooling can, can be a wonderful outlet for them. And and schools, you know, I, I remember seeing the television in my classroom when I was in elementary school, but I, ne I have no memory of it ever being turned on. I have no memory of a teacher even using a telephone in a classroom. Um, and these are the tools that we use every day of our life. And now with the computer and the mobile phones, uh, cell phones and so on, tablets, I mean, we use them to get jobs done. We use them to, to run our, our families but we deny children access to them in school. And that to me is a, is, is, is a big problem and, uh, and one of the things that schools could learn. And I think, again, if we go back to Sagata Mitra, he shows a great example of, of, of how you can pro inexpensively provide access to technology for children. Um, so it, you know, it doesn't have to be, I mean, most homeschooling families, studies have shown that most homeschooling families spend an average of between $500 and $600 per child per year on classes, books, and equipment. Um, it's not that expensive a deal, um, you know, particularly when you're you know, sharing a computer and, and other stuff at, at home. Um, there's a lot of, of opportunity uh, for technology, um, but I think that we tend to fall in love with the idea of technology, again, because as we noted earlier, Steve, it, it can be commoditized, sold, and resold, upgraded, you know, and, and, it, and it becomes and it's a subscription model for a business because they love predictability, so it's great. But um, we forget that you don't need technology to learn. It's great cause, because we're moving in that direction, but to be shown how to use it by another person is, is invaluable. And that human contact is, is the key. When technology enhances that, sort of a, as this, this session is doing here, putting us in touch with one another instead of separating us. Um, you know, all too often I just find you know, the, techno the technological aspects of education to simply be school ported to the Internet. Um, Khan Academy is wonderful, but it's a very one-sided discussion. And, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's only one way to explore math. I mean, there are many, many other ways of getting into math. Um, and technology, I, I think, is one of those things that we are not using to its full capability. And I hope that homeschoolers will, you know, show parents. And I think people will be surprised at how technology is being used uh, by homeschoolers. I know that just, just today in my email, there was a, one of the homeschooling lists received us uh, request from Harvard University, some professor there, assistant professor is going to do a study because of homeschoolers and de-schoolers as they call them, um, because they suspect that they are using more resources for learning than people think. And I, I just kind of puzzled me. It's like I've been here for 30 years and, and I'm still seeing I, a new research group just got started last week on the international level. And they're claiming that, you know, we still don't know if adults who are homeschooled are successful. We still don't know if kids who are homeschooled do well if they go back to school. You know, there's only so much that research is going to show us, you know, or can show us. It's always going to be lagging behind anyway. I mean, who learned to use computers quickest and best? It was kids. 
Who learned to use cell phones quickest and best? It was kids. Let's, let, when are we going to figure this out? And just put these tools in kids' hands. I remember when uh, superconductors first came out. Probably the best comment I, I read about them was, you know, they're trying to figure out how can we figure out new uses for this incredible in, uh, technology. And one of the inventors or, or scientists that's affiliated with it said, we should figure out how to make a little package of these superconducting magnets that kindergartners could play with and see what they do with them. That is the right attitude, I think, about technology. It's interesting. I did an interview series on open source software and education and um, interviewed a lot of people who have been very significant in the development of open source technologies and, and therefore the internet. And uh, every one of them did that work outside of traditional schooling. Uh, there are two more questions. Do we keep going or are you done? Okay, sure. Let's keep going. <laughs> You're a good man. Okay. <laughs> Do you know the maker movement? No. Okay, so I we'll don't. skip this question, but the maker movement is uh, these maker fairs where people get together and showcase things that they've built by hand. It's really a lot of fun. You'll, oh, that sounds great. You should great. look it up, maker fairs, and uh, my, yeah. my guess is that you'll like them quite a bit. And then, so the final question yeah. would be, is it, from Peggy, is it primarily parents with mid-higher level incomes that choose unschooling or homeschooling? No. There has been a lot of of disinformation sent out about um, the demographics of, of homeschoolers. And a lot of it is based on the, the, the flaws and issues in research. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy with, with homeschool research is, is how they use, researchers use the same facts and figures to argue both ends, for instance, them, you know, the wealthy. If you look at the U.S. Um, Department of Education statistics um, on homeschooling, and they've done surveys, I think, in 1999, 2003, and 2007. Um, they, a they ask about income level, and the vast majority of homeschooling families are earning $75,000 or less. That's the top. There are wealthy families homeschooling, no doubt, but they are not in the majority. So now, where does this idea that they are upper middle class families that are homeschooling? There was a study done um, by Lawrence Rudner and um, HSLVA, Homeschool Legal Defense Association, really publicized it when it came out. It says homeschoolers test better. And it turns out that he used as a sample members of Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Well, the first thing, so right there, their income levels are higher because these are families that are, are happy to pay 100 or $150, I think it's $100 a year, for legal protection. They used to call it legal insurance in the 80s, but legal protection now uh, in case someone, some school official is going to challenge you for being truant or something, uh, which is a very, very rare occurrence. And, you know, uh, but anyway, they are, you know, their families tend to have higher incomes. So, you know, people cite that and then say, oh, look, you know, these homeschoolers are so wealthy because, you know, of course they test well. They come from these wealthy families. And then the same research will say, but this study is useless because it's a sample of just like these, these you know, self-selected sample, like only people who wanted to send in their test scores did, and that's why they test so high. So it, it gets very confusing, but if you really want to, 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 to get a feel for homeschooling, I suggest going to a support group meeting, a local one or state, or if you're in a state that has a large state group, North Carolina and Florida, too, that come to mind, uh, their, their homeschooling conferences attract anywhere between five and 10,000 people each year. You'll, you'll get a good, a good cross-section of, of, of the demographics of, of homeschoolers, and you'll see that they are always <laughs> pinching their pennies and trying to make ends meet. Um, you, know, we're, you know, I mean, I, it's always a mystery to me when people say, oh, you're, you're just a bunch of wealthy elitists, you know, who can afford to keep your kids out of school. Um, my wife and I both worked the whole time. We're a two-income family, and we homeschool that whole time. I'm aware of single moms who homeschool. Um, you, you do what you have to do. If your kids are suffering in school or if school just scares the daylights out of them and you, you're just philosophically opposed to putting them in it, you'll figure it out. And very often, these are parents without means who have to figure this out. Pat, you've been 
thoughtful and generous with your time. Uh, uh, that was the last question, so I think we're going to close up. I'm clapping for you. Okay. I hate where the applause icon is in this program, but you go over the smiley face and go down to applause. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs> My pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. And thanks for staying late with us. Really appreciate it. Coming up on the Future of Education on Thursday, Shelley Blake Plock on the Digital Harbor Foundation. Then next week, schools cannot do it alone, what students should learn in the 21st century, and schools that change communities. Thanks to Pat. Thanks to you for joining us. Take care, everybody, and have a good night. You too, Steve. Thanks, Pat. You're welcome.